Hello, everyone, and welcome to confirmation on January 13th, Wednesday, 2021, our first confirmation class of the new year. Uh, we're excited to begin with you guys. And as you can see there, uh, we're going to be going through a few housekeeping items today at the beginning of class uh, before we jump into the New Testament. Um, and we're excited to talk about that. But because of the pandemic restrictions and um, the current shutdown at church and things like that. And we know that learning online has been a little bit harder um, and it's there's a lot of Zoom fatigue going around. And so I've given some thought over the last month or so on how to kind of streamline the rest of confirmation for you guys for the year. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of these, these changes for you and we're gonna send these documents out afterwards. I just, I didn't want to send them out beforehand because I wanted to let you guys hear the explanation so there wasn't confusion over it. But uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask those things. But the bottom line is these changes are all in your favor. I want to make it easier for you guys, okay? Um, okay. So feel free to ask if you have questions along the way. But you can see the schedule there for 2021, right? Um, and you can see my mouse moving on there. Um, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So you'll notice today's January 13th, and we have one, two, three, four, five sessions that are going to be uh, dedicated to the narrative, the story of the New Testament. And then after that, you'll notice that we have group review. Um, February the 24th, we're not going to have class, but you can still review stuff then. We're going to have review together all the way up until Confirmation Sunday, which is the, the day you give your testimony and your exam. So I've put in extra time for us to review together the, the materials and the things that you're going to be quizzed on in classes um, to make sure that you guys succeed. I don't want Confirmation to be stressful for you. Um, especially with all the Zoom stuff. I know that makes learning more difficult. Um, and so when we get to that, those review sessions, basically what we'll do is we'll go through different parts of the, um, of the divine narrative that we've kind of been going through. And you guys know all of the different story slides that I've been showing you um, in the, our PowerPoints. You guys know what I'm talking about, where they have all yeah. the, the arrows and symbols and stuff. Basically, we'll go through some of those and I'll assign you a little, I'll assign each of you a little bit more each week. Um, but say, for example, I asked Emma um, in our first review session what the symbol for God was. And she would, and she may know, she may not be able to explain it all. But I would say, okay, Emma, this is going to be your assigned, one of your assigned questions. And we'll all learn it together, but then we can kind of work through it. And it's okay if nobody doesn't know it, but you'll have a list of questions that grows each week. So you'll know exactly what you're going to be asked in the final exam. Okay. Um, Pastor Kyle. Yeah. Um, so Mia and I, we, um, we have a lot of memory work to catch up on mm -hmm. from November 1st to December. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll get, get to that in a minute. I want to, okay. we're going to simplify that too. Okay. Uh, but does that make sense for the, for the group review portion um, and the schedule there for how that, that'll work? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you guys, my, my, the whole thing is I want to make it manageable for you. And I would rather have you know a few things really well than give you a ton of busy work and overwhelm you. Um, so, and each, each week we get to the, in the group review session, you know, maybe that first section will review Genesis through Deuteronomy or whatever. And that week you'll get all the questions that you personally are gonna answer um, with the answers. We'll fill those out in class together, okay? Any questions or comments on that? Does that sound like a good thing to you guys, hopefully? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
I so, have a question. Yes, go ahead, Whit. So as far as the commandments and the creed go for the mm -hmm. memory work, are we going to have to say all of them and say the creed? Is that the memory work? Not them? quite, not quite. And um, I'm getting there. The uh, That is just kind of a suggested order for those things. But each of you is going to have, rather than say you wit having to know all 10 commandments and their explanations and the creed and all the different explanations there, we're gonna break it up um, so that everybody just has like a couple co commandments assigned. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get that document up in just a second, but you can kind of see the, um, the general, this is just a suggestion in that right-hand column on what I would suggest maybe um, to make it manageable for you um, as you memorize there, okay? Okay. Um, so, do you, yeah. So do you still, you still want us uh, to do our catch up, right? Um, not quite, not quite. Um, okay. So you'll see here that I, you, get, you can see this new document. All right. And I'll send this out too, but uh, what I've done here, and this is for the remainder of the, the semester or the, the uh, confirmation year, is I've basically broken it up for each of you guys. And I've given you essentially five individual things that I want you to memorize and have uh, memorized really well. And if you haven't gotten all the memorization done for the uh, for the fall portion of the year for 2020, I don't want you to worry about that. Okay. Um, okay. If you okay, guys, so, would um, you, yeah, go ahead. Um, so we have it from November 1st. So you don't want us to worry about that. Just do these ones. Yep. Yep. Okay. And. Um, Basically, you know, I, memorizing scripture is always beneficial, and I would encourage you guys to keep doing that. You should keep doing that, but I know we can only do so much, and I know, you know, you guys are on screens, or you have um, classwork that's hybrid and everything right now, and to go from doing that for four hours or whatever, and then to suddenly go and have to do confirmation stuff and all these other things. I know that's a lot right now and it's pretty tough. So how this is gonna work, um, you see for instance, uh, in that first column of Nina's there, Nina is going to be assigned the fourth commandment with its explanation, the ninth commandment with its explanation, and then the, the second article of the creed on redemption and its explanation, and then these two scripture verses, and everybody should know the books of the Bible. I'm just putting in that in for everybody. Um, but those are, and then obviously she'll have the specific answers that we'll be doing in the whole review period for the narrative of scripture. Like if I asked her a question about the Exodus, she'll get those later. Um, but that's not gonna be a strictly word for word memorized answer. Um, she might just, if I asked her um, what happened on the night of the Passover, she doesn't have to have it a word for word answer there. Um, so, uh, but these are the only things word for word that you guys are going to be memorizing. So, you know, now, um, and these are, these are going to be answers to some of the questions in the final examination. Uh, but other than that, there's no more memory work. Okay? Mm -hmm. Does that... Oh. <laughs> everyone still alive over there? <laughs> Most Mostly, okay. Uh, so does, does this make sense to you guys? Yeah. yeah. Will we be able to print this out so we can see it? Yep, yeah. 
Um, like I said, I just didn't want to send it out beforehand because I didn't want there to be confusion or, or worry about it or anything. I thought it would be easier to explain in person or while well, we can actually talk face to face. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my hope is that that should significantly cut back on your guys' workload because there are basically these five pieces of memory work here but you notice how many weeks there are to memorize it, right? That's a lot of time. Weeks. A lot, a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven weeks, basically, for five. And you guys each have five sections. Now, the the creed stuff is a little bit longer. I will say, that's a fat paragraph there. Um, but you notice that. Like Nina and Witt, you guys both have the second article. And Emma and Mia, you guys both have the third article. So you can help each other out with those things. And then Wes and I, I'll help Wes out with the first article there. Um, but that should hopefully cut back on your guys' workload. Um, and I hope it's less intimidating that way. And you'll this way, you'll know everything that you're, you are memorizing is going to help you out in the final exam too. But what that means is you do need to have it memorized pretty well, okay? And you need to have it memorized well for the uh, the final exam, not just for next week. Um, so for example, um, on February 3rd, if you know the creed then, the, your, port, your section of the creed, but you don't know it on exam day, well, that, that's not good. So it can't just be short-term memory here. All right? Any questions? Does this seem like an improvement? Does it seem more doable? Okay. Yes. Right. Yep. Yep. Good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, because I know this year has just been kind of nuts. And then the last thing I want to share with you guys here, um, this is the, these are the instructions for the testimony that you're going to give. Oh, uh, before I get to this, actually. So for the, the examination with the questions, that may or may not be during a Bible hour in front of the congregation, because we just don't know yet if we're even going to be having Bible study. All right. But what it will probably be at this point is maybe um, the six or seven, the seven of us with Wes, right? Um, and then Pastor Allen and maybe a couple of other adults in the uh, multi-purpose room. And what we would like, where we gathered for confirmation before. And what we would probably do then is record it so that people could in the church could hear the answers without having to all be there and be crowded and everything. So that would be how that would happen. It might be, you know, if we're back open, it might be during the 930 Bible study hour. If we're not, maybe it would be that Sunday afternoon. Does that make sense? Okay, but either way, that will be on Sunday, March 28th down here at the bottom. On that same day, you'll, you will also give a testimony, that's Palm Sunday too, by the way, um, in front of the congregation during the worship service. So we'll at least have that uh, live streamed or outside. Now I, that sounds intimidating, don't worry. Peace be unto you, all right? Uh, the instructions are right here. And you can write between three quarters of a page, I'll zoom in on this, to a page and a half, all right? And you, you're encouraged to use favorite Bible verses, Bible stories, experiences you've had with other Christians as illustrations, um, all those sorts of things. And if you need help, I'm more than happy to help you. So just contact me, your parents can call me, or we can set up a Zoom meeting. I can come over, sit on the patio, and kind of help you get going, all that stuff. Um, but you do need to submit it to me by March 10th for review. But you can answer any one of these following three questions 
to write about. And then you can, you can write it and have it all prepared. And then all you have to do is stand up and read it in front of the congregation, okay? Which means like you're up there for a minute um, and everything's all prepared and it's not, it's not a big deal, okay? Any um, questions I, on that? I have a question though. Mm -hmm. Is it first year for confirmation and second year or is it just them? Um, yeah, it's it's just the second year students. So uh, good question, Nina. Thank you. Uh, so you are um, you are spared for a, a for a year there. Just get to think about it. You get to do it when there's not COVID, Nina. Uh, yeah, you get to live in dread for another year. <laughs> All right, but um, and you can see the three. There, there are more than one, there's more than one question for each of these, but you can pick one of these three options, or if you want to combine them, that's fine too. Those are just some ideas to kind of get you started and maybe get you thinking there. Um, I can't see Emma and Mia, but Emma and Mia, do you guys have any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so the, and the idea there is it doesn't have to be the most polished thing in the world, right? You don't need to worry about it being some masterpiece or like a sermon or anything like that. It's just to give an idea uh, to the congregation of what you've been learning and what your faith um, means to you. And remember, the congregation is like they're they may be quiet and listening, but they're all cheering you on inside. They're like, yeah, go, go. You know, and they're all excited to, to hear about you taking ownership of your faith. Uh, so just remember that. Right? Yep. I'm sorry, you're my sister. No, that's okay. <laughs> Hi, Lily, in the background. Now she's quiet. Oh, you're muted. That's why. All right. So that's all I have on those things. Um, I would ask that you guys keep doing your sermon notes. All right, and keep submitting those when you come into church and can do that. And then um, I have a question about the sermon notes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, after, after the lesson, um, can you tell me how uh, many I have due um, for this month and then any that I've missed? Sure, yeah, I don't have that up in front of me right now. Um, but I can send an e I'll send an email. How's that? Okay. okay thanks. Um, and it's, so if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's, it's two a month um, is the amount that you're supposed to submit. So keep doing that. Um, and then the only, the only other thing I would ask, um, since we're kind of sticking in the new Testament now, um, and I thought this would be a, hopefully this will be a fun thing for you guys, right? Is we're going to be used primarily using Mark to go through the, the gospels in Jesus life. And so I thought, uh, do you guys, do your families all have Netflix? Yeah. Okay. And what about you, Whit and Nina? Yep. Okay. So on Netflix, you can type in the gospel of Mark. All right, and it will give you um, a word for word um, video of the Gospel of Mark that you can watch in chunks with your families. And so I would just encourage you to watch that. Um, I'm not going to send out like you have to watch, you know, from this minute to this minute this week, but I, that would be maybe a really fun way to hear scripture in a different way rather than having to read it. And the scenery and everything and um, the acting is pretty cool. So I'd encourage you guys to do that. You could even sit down as a family and may you, maybe you just watch 10 minutes a night and you'll be through it before you know it. it it's pretty captivating actually. Yeah, I think okay. that we might've watched that one a few years ago, but it wouldn't hurt to watch it again. Yeah, and they have one for each of the gospels. So you might've watched a different one. It's the same actor that was Jesus and all that. Okay, any further questions, guys? Um, 
No. All right. So we're going to go ahead then and start on our, our actual lesson for today. And hopefully you guys all got the printouts that were sent and you can follow along with those. We got uh, all of them. If you want to use scratch paper, that's fine uh, too. But uh, we're going to be looking at, we've gone through all the Old Testament here and we've been waiting for the Messiah to come, right? All the way back in Genesis, there was the promised Messiah who was going to step on the head of the serpent, who is going to reverse the fall, reverse the curse on creation, and restore us to a right relationship with God, defeat sin, de death, and the devil. And now we're finally to the New Testament. We're finally to that Messiah coming in Jesus. And so this week, we're going to be looking a little bit at some of the claims that Jesus makes as the Messiah and, and his life. And Mark does a good job of that. Just as a reminder here, you can see the um, some of the timeline there for the Bible that we've been going through, uh, and, and it's hundreds of years there, over a thousand years, uh, just from the Exodus. And so we're at well, this all kind of takes place between about six BC and thirty BC or thirty AD, give or take a little bit. And I want to point out to you guys, um, you can all see this diagram here, and it looks kind of like a bow tie, right? If you look at it, you guys see that? You guys see how it looks like a bow tie there? Yeah, nod for me. And um, and then at the center of that is a are some Greek letters that stand for the name of Christ. And what I like about this diagram is it kind of shows that at the center of the scriptural narrative, the story that we've been looking at is Christ, the center of everything. And the people um, at the very beginning, you guys see how on the left side here where my mouse is, on the left side of this diagram, history was narrowing down to Christ. Everybody was looking ahead to Christ. All their hope was in him. Their history was all narrowing down to Christ as they looked ahead to him. And then on the right side of the diagram there, history flows out of Christ and the new creation. Um, but either way, um, even today, we look back at Christ and we also look ahead at Christ on whether you, you live before him in your earthly life or after him. We're all looking to Christ. He's at the center of everything. And what I also like about this diagram is that it starts off with creation, and but that ends with the new creation, because that's where we're going. So it's full circle. Yes, Nina. Um, we're are we on our worksheet yet? No, 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 no. Um, oh, and, oh, yes. Yeah. But when we are on our worksheet, could you like say we move? Can you see all the questions? Can you see the questions that we have? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you guys, um, yeah. which question we're on. Yeah, like if we're on illustration, something, something. Just sure. Like, oh, yep. Yep. We will do that. Um, so this was, but yeah, this, there's no question attached to this. It was just a fun diagram. Okay. Okay. So, uh, we're, we, and we may not get through all of the, um, the questions and things today, that's okay. We can pick it up next week since we spent some time looking at uh, the other stuff there. So we're going to go ahead and watch a quick video overview of the New Testament now from our friends at the Bible Project. Can you guys all see that? Can you guys see that? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. Emma, Mia, you guys can see it too? Yeah. All right. So we'll go ahead and watch this real quickly just to get a bit of an overview of that. And then we'll jump into the lesson. The New Testament. 
If you open up a Bible to its table of contents, you'll see it's made up of two large collections, the Old and New Testaments. The word testament refers to a covenant partnership, which is what both of these collections are all about. They you guys can hear it too? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Tell one epic and complicated story of God's covenant partnership with Israel and all humanity. The Old Testament is called Tanakh in Jewish tradition. It's a unified scroll collection of 39 Israelites. 39 Israelites. We're over a thousand years in the making. In contrast, the 27 books of the New Testament all came into existence within 30 to 40 years of each other. They were all written by first generation followers of Jesus. From an early period, Christian communities began collecting these texts and reading them alongside the Old Testament as one unified story that leads to Jesus. The New Testament begins with four narrative books that together are called the gospel. They tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth's life, death, and resurrection as an announcement of good news. They're followed by a fifth narrative work called Acts of the Apostles. Here, the risen Jesus commissions the apostles, a word that means the sent ones. They're appointed as Jesus's representatives to spread the good news about him throughout the ancient world. After Acts comes a collection of letters from the apostles. These were written to provide teaching and guidance for local communities of Jesus' followers called churches. There are 13 letters connected to the Apostle Paul, and they're not arranged in the order of when they were written, but rather from the longest to the shortest. Then there's a letter to the Hebrews, written by a close but unnamed associate of the Apostles. After this are the letters of James, Jude, Peter, and John. Two were brothers of Jesus, and two were among his first followers. The last New Testament book is the Revelation, a letter to seven churches that reveals a prophetic word of challenge and comfort to all of Jesus's followers. So those are the books of the New Testament, but what are they about? And how do they connect with the Old Testament to make up one unified story? Think of it this way. The Bible is one long epic narrative with multiple movements or acts. The Old Testament recounts the first series of acts that give you everything you need to make sense of the story to follow. The core themes and the plot conflict are arranged in design patterns. And then in the New Testament, these are all picked up and carried forward to the story's culmination in Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. The first act is about God and all humanity. God provides a sweet garden temple for humans who are made to be God's partners in ruling the world. But the humans are foolish, and they give in to a dark temptation and rebel against God's wisdom. So they're exiled into a wilderness where they start killing each other. They build cities that spread their selfishness and oppression, leading up to the big bad city of Babylon. But God loves the world and its foolish humans, so he sets in motion a rescue plan by promising the arrival of a new human who will destroy the evil that has lured us into self-destruction. The next act of the biblical story is about God and Israel and it develops the themes and patterns of the first act. God calls a new humanity out of Babylon into a sweet garden land, Abraham, Sarah, and his descendants, the Israelites. God promises that through them, divine blessing will be restored to all of the nations. Surely these are the new humans that we're waiting for, but the Israelites repeat humanity's rebellion against God, building their own violent cities that lead to self-destruction and another exile in Babylon. But God sustains his promise that the new human will come from Abraham's lineage. It will be a priest king who will now have to rescue both Israel and humanity from Babylon to restore God's blessing to the world. Now, notice how these two acts are designed according to the same pattern. The second act is a longer and more violent version of the first, and together they explore the tragic human condition, but they also highlight God's promise, which is developed more in the next act, the Old Testament prophets and poets. The prophets accused Israel and all nations of their evil, and they announced that one day God himself would arise to bring the day of the Lord and deliver his world from Babylon. He would do it through a promised royal priest who's going to suffer like a slave and die for the sins of Israel and all humanity, but then he'll be exalted as king over the nations. He will call others to leave Babylon and join the new covenant people who will partner with God to rule over a new Jerusalem, that is, over a new creation. And so the Old Testament concludes by anticipating a new act in the story. And when you turn to the New Testament, it's the same story now being carried forward in Jesus. Let's see how. The four gospel accounts introduce Jesus of Nazareth, both as the promised son of Abraham who will restore God's blessing to the nations, and also as that new human who will defeat evil and restore humanity to partnership with God. So Jesus is portrayed as a human and more. He went about announcing the arrival of God's promised kingdom, and he spoke and acted as if he was Israel's divine king. 
But instead of calling himself king, Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, that is, the human one who would act like a servant. The Gospels are making the claim that in Jesus, Israel's God has become the faithful Israelite and the true human that we are all made to be but have failed to be. Jesus' mission was to confront that dark evil that lurks underneath humanity's evil, luring us into selfishness, violence, and death. But how do you defeat that kind of evil? The surprising answer in the Gospels is that Jesus overcame our evil by allowing it to kill him on his paradoxical throne, the cross, where Jesus died for humanity's evil and sin. And it's where he lived out what he taught that nonviolence, forgiveness, and self-giving love are the most powerful things in the universe. And because God's love for his world is stronger than evil or death, Jesus was raised to new life as the prototype of a new humanity, and this brings us to the story of Acts. Through the Spirit, God empowers Jesus' followers to spread the life and love of Jesus out into the world as they invite people to leave their old humanity and join Jesus' multi-ethnic family, the new humanity. This is where the letters from the apostles fit into the story. Here the apostles address early Christian communities and they show how the good news about the risen King Jesus changed history and should reshape every part of our lives. They also explained the good news by constantly appealing to stories from the Old Testament and the story stories of Jesus, showing us how to see our own life stories as part of the epic biblical story. So all humanity is trapped in a Babylonian exile, but Jesus came to create a new home. We're all living in different kinds of Egyptian slavery to selfishness and sin, but Jesus died as the Passover lamb to liberate us into the promised land. Our old humanity is bound for the dust of death, but Jesus' resurrection opened up a new future for a new humanity. We live here in the current evil age, but through Jesus and the Spirit, a new creation has burst open here and now. And this leads us to the book of Revelation, where the whole biblical story comes together in powerful symbolism and imagery. Jesus is portrayed as a slaughtered, bloody lamb, who is exalted as the divine king of the world. He's leading his people out of slavery and exile in Babylon. And as they resist Babylon's influence, they may have to suffer alongside their slain leader. But when you follow the risen king, not even death can prevent the dawn of the new creation, which is here depicted as a new Jerusalem garden temple, the true home of humanity after its long exile. And so on the Bible's last page, heaven and earth are reunited and the new humans take up their appointed task from the Bible's first page to rule the world together in the love and power of God. The New Testament is a remarkable collection of documents. They represent the testimony of the apostles that points us to the risen Jesus himself. And through God's spirit, these human words have been speaking a divine word of hope from the first century to the 21st. Each book shows how God, through Jesus and the spirit, is leading our world to its ultimate goal in a renewed creation. And so the story's end is really the beginning of a new story that is yet to be told. And that's what the New Testament is all about. All right. So uh, I know that was a lot in there, um, but I thought that was, given that it's been a while since we met, it was hopefully a good review of some of the Old Testament stuff we looked at, and um, it also had kind of a good overview of the New Testament. There are Jesus' life and uh, his, his mission to save the world, and then the letters from the apostles um, that went out to the different churches telling them that Jesus had saved the world, and then the book of Revelation, which talks about the world to come. And the new creation to come. We started in creation and we're heading back to creation. Um, and I don't know if you guys caught in there, what did the narrator say the most powerful force in the world is that we see in Jesus? Did you guys catch that? I know there was a lot in there. He said the most powerful force in the world is sacrific sacrificial self-giving love. That doesn't seem very powerful sometimes when you see, you think about Jesus stretched out on a cross, uh, refusing to engage in violence, refusing to engage in retaliation, to strike back at his, his enemies. Um, but in doing that, Jesus showed that God's love is more powerful than all those forces, that he could even be killed and God would still raise him from the dead, that God would still bring about victory. 
And I think that's really important for us to remember throughout all of our lives, but especially in times when there is a lot of anger or fear or conflict. Um, and Christians can be different that way because we have a, a special hope in Jesus of the resurrection. Does that make sense? Okay. And I'm going to ask you guys to unmute yourselves now because uh, we're going to get into the actual lesson here. All right. So today, uh, and these are the, oh. the FBI warnings and all those things. Um, but we're looking at the messianic age that has come and some of the basic claims there. Okay. So, so we're about to, you can pull out your worksheets and we'll start looking at those. For this first one, uh, there are not questions associated with this. You can write down a couple notes here, uh, but we're not on the first question yet. Okay. But you see here the promised land, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. And um, this is kind of the stage that Jesus's ministry took place in. So it's actually not that big a part of the world, but a lot of important stuff has happened here, and it's where a lot of Israel's history took place. Uh, but about the time, uh, a, a bit before Jesus was born, Herod the Great was in power. He came into power about 37 BC. Jesus was born uh, about 30 years later, give or take. And uh, Herod expanded his territory into all these areas that we see here. He kind of started like this, and then he expanded it up into Galilee and into Perea there. You'll notice uh, Jesus' hometown here of Nazareth is right there. He was born in Bethlehem, but he lived in Nazareth. So he controlled those areas as well. And he built a big temple to Caesar Augustus, a big palace in Jerusalem. Um, and he lived a very rich, powerful sort of lifestyle. And so that's kind of the backdrop of uh, where Jesus' life and ministry took place. And if you guys remember, we talked about all those empires last time that were constantly conquering the Israelite people, if you remember that. So they lived kind of under the shadow of all of these people there. You guys hear? Okay. I'm getting a little bit of an echo, but if you guys yeah can hear uh, we can hear yeah. you fine okay and emma mia you can hear okay yeah yeah all right good so he and herod's reign kind of expanded all over here as we see in those colored areas he eventually would give it give his territory to his three sons and one of whom his reign didn't last very long but we hear about uh, another son of his also named herod later on in the New Testament in the book of Acts, um, Herod Antipas, who is there with Paul when Paul's being tried and things, uh, when he's on trial, as we heard about this summer. So, uh, you'll notice this line going down the center, the river, you can see there, and you see it kind of splitting this territory in half. Do you guys see that there? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the Jordan River. And I'm not going to make you guys memorize a bunch of geography or anything like that, but it's kind of important as a, a geographical boundary. We'll talk about that. It kind of marked uh, the promised land, Israel, and their border there. And some Israelites lived to the right there, but most of Israel was to the left. And you can see up uh, surrounding the Sea of Galilee here uh, were a lot of, and you see the, the big word in bold, Decapolis. You guys see that? Yeah. Yep. Decapolis basically means 10 cities there, and it's referring to Gentile cities. Now, who are the Gentiles? Do you guys remember? They were the non Jews. Exactly. They were the non-Jews. And at the time Jesus was conducting his ministry, how did the Israelites feel about the Gentiles or the non-Jews? Did they have good relationships, bad? 
really bad relationships. Wit says really bad relationships. What about the rest of you? You think good or bad? Just who I thinks think bad? You think bad? Yeah. Yep, you guys are right. They had bad relationships. And so if Jesus went and he talked to some of these Gentiles, as you can see throughout the Gospels, his fellow Israelites wouldn't be too happy. So that's just the dynamic to keep in mind. But he, he went to them anyway, because his mission was to bring the good news, the gospel to all people there. Um, and he did all sorts of cool miracles there. One of the loaves and fishes events where he multiplied loaves and fishes was given to a bunch of those people. And um, there were seven basketfuls of loaves and fishes left over. Mm -hmm. And there were seven Gentile nations surrounding Israel. And kind of this, the sim, what do you think the symbolism there is? What's the message there? He was giving loaves and fishes to Gentiles and there are seven leftover baskets of leftovers and seven Gentile nations. What do you think Jesus might have kind of been getting at there? Like, I guess maybe like the Gentiles are important too. It's not just the Jews. Exactly, Nina, exactly. In having seven baskets of leftovers, he's saying that there is enough here for everyone and more even, right? The riches of God's grace and his promises are for everybody. There's enough here for everyone. Um, it's kind of like if you guys have ever been to a family event and you're like last in line, right? At the food table and you get there and some of the dishes have run out Oh. that's a bummer right yeah and here it's like jesus is saying that's not even, there's no risk of that there is there's more than enough for everybody there's more than enough for everybody for all of humanity now in here in the last year we've had a lot of division a lot of hatred between people um around the country and around the planet even um, fighting with each other. And it's important to realize that the Christian faith says that we all can be peaceful and unified in, in Jesus Christ. That's a religion of love. It's a religion of harmony. Um, unlike a lot of what the rest of the world is doing. And uh, so if you guys are ever thinking, man, I, you know, if you're sad about those things, or you, you feel like, you know, you're you're feeling sad about the divisions in the world and those sorts of things like that, the walls people put up between each other, you can remember that Christianity isn't that sort of a religion. And anybody that claims or acts that way, like it's a religion of barriers or walls, doesn't know it very well. All right. So we see here um, Jesus... Uh, ministry took place in um, kind of these red circles there. He'd go to Jerusalem there too, but he'd also in these other arrows go to the Gentile areas, which is what that's getting at there. And you see he had a loaves and fishes. He multiplied loaves and fishes for a Jewish audience, an Israelite, Israelite audience. And he also multiplied them for a Gentile audience there. So he's a savior for Jews and Gentiles. And in the gospel of Mark, he restores sight to the blind. Um, here, there, you guys see the eyeball. So he restores sight to the blind. He makes a prediction that he's going to go to the cross and die. He makes another prediction, and people still don't get it. That he's going to go to the cross and die. He makes a third prediction. He's going to go to the cross and die. So do you guys think that Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross and die? Yeah. I think yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of obvious, but sometimes people say that there's, you know, that Jesus didn't know, or they think he was uh, a, those sorts of things. And 
he knew what he was doing. He wanted to go and to save you, uh, even though he prayed in the garden, you know, if there's another way, let it be done. But uh, Jesus wanted to save humanity. And then a second time here, he restores sight to the blind, um, but not a third time in the gospel of Mosk. So we have these three crosses here, three passion predictions, but only two times he restores sight to the blind. Whoa. So there's, there's a difference there. And uh, what do you guys think about that difference? Does it make you think maybe that there's going to be a third time? Yeah. Yeah, you think there's yeah. going to be a third a third time that sight is restored to the blind, but it's not going to be physical sight. The gospel of Mark is kind of getting at. It's going to be that uh, our we're going to be our eyes are going to be open spiritually to recognize who Jesus is. And that's yeah, that's kind of what Mark is getting at, and kind of how he ends the gospel too. All righty here, so. Um, I think that's good for, for that section there. So looking at uh, your guys's questions there, um, the Jews had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic age for centuries. Right, and we're, I'll get to your, your first question there on 13b, letter A, in just a second. Um, they'd been waiting for centuries for their, the promised Messiah. And the New Testament insists that Jesus is that Messiah. He's the fulfillment of all of their Old Testament hopes there. And Mark does a good job of kind of dealing with, A, what kind of Messiah was Jesus, and then also, what kind of kingdom was he going to have? If he's a king, what kind of kingdom are you going to have? Um, and what does this mean for the people that live in Jesus' kingdom? And so Mark begins his narrative with the statement that the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the good news is that the, the kingdom of the Messiah has finally arrived, that the Messiah is finally there and that it's begun. And Jesus is the Christ or the anointed one. That's what Christ and Messiah mean is anointed one. Um, like they put oil on the kings in the Old Testament. They'd anoint them. And that he's finally come. And so um, you see there in letter A there of your question, Jesus' identity and role, the anointed one. So he's the Messiah. Or the Christ, whichever. Okay. And then um, Jesus is also the new Israel. And then thirdly, he is the son of God. Because in the Old Testament, a lot of times God would call Israel his son. But Israel kind of failed to be a faithful son to God. And so Jesus comes along and it's like he's going to repeat Israel's history. Except that he's going to do it as a faithful son. So like you guys remember, Israel wandered in the wilderness. Well, Jesus wanders in the wilderness is, and is tempted, except he's faithful. And Israel uh, crossed the waters of the Jordan, and so did Jesus. If you were here this last Sunday uh, with the sermon, you heard about how Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, just like the Israelites went through the Jordan. And so Jesus is going to do all the same things Israel did as God's son, except he's going to be faithful. Um, I went to the bathroom real quick. Uh, did we answer any questions? Yes, um, we answered question uh, 13A. 
there. So Jesus, identity and role, and maybe Mia can help you out there too. But, um, I don't think she got it because she she was filling up her water. Okay. So um, Jesus is the Messiah. Okay. And uh, the new Israel. And the son of God. Okay. Okay. And um, you can also say he's the fulfillment of all Israel's dreams. Because all their, and you don't have to write all this, but all their dreams were that the Messiah would come and forgive sins, that he would save them from sin, death, and the devil, from the serpent, all those sorts of things. Now, uh, when we talk about forgiving sins and the Messiah doing that, Mark is not saying that this is the first time God has ever forgiven sins or something, like that all the people were born before Jesus, their sins weren't forgiven. That's not what he's getting at. Um, he's saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those hopes that uh, sins would be forgiven once and for all, that no more sacrifices in the Old Testament system were needed. Jesus is why God could forgive sins of people in the Old Testament. Um, so it's kind of a funny uh, time difference there um, where God was looking ahead to, to Jesus. And that's um, was always the plan. And that's part of why God forgives sins there, even before Jesus comes. So looking at question B in 13B there, what building would Jesus eventually visit? Well, in Mark 1 verse 2, uh, we hear there, I'll just pull it up real quickly. If you guys have your Bibles and you just want to open up some Mark, that'd be great, but I'll read it for us here. Uh, Mark 1, 2 says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Well, those passages are drawing on Isaiah. They're drawing on Exodus. They're drawing on Malachi, all these Old Testament books. And um, those those Old Testament passages, we, we're not going to go to all those for the sake of time, but they refer to God's temple. And so the building there, uh, that's the answer to question B, the building that Jesus would eventually visit is God's temple. Um, and where was God's temple located? What city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Very good. Um and in Mark's gospel, and you can write this too in your answer there, Jesus visits in Holy Week. Now, what happened at the end of Holy Week? We celebrate Holy Week still. You guys know what? What big holiday is associated with Holy Week there? It's coming up. Easter. Easter, that's right. So Jesus entered the temple in his final week of life. And part of what Jesus is kind of saying there is that you don't need the old temple anymore, guys. I'm the temple. I'm the final sacrifice. And so Jesus is bigger, he's, the, he's better, he's the fulfillment of all of these um, Old Testament laws and prophecies and uh, sacrificial systems and temples. All these things point to Jesus. All right? Okay. So... Um, 
but Jesus, but the, the New Testament Jewish religious leaders, they're pretty attached to the temple. They don't like that, you can imagine, because Jesus, if somebody came along and said, oh, you guys don't need to do that anymore, um, they get pretty upset about that. And that's part of why they, they kill Jesus, actually. They arrange for his death um, because they didn't want the sacrifice that God was going to give them to take away the sins of the world. They kind of wanted to keep going with the way things were. All right. So getting to question C there, you guys have on your worksheet. In Mark verse 1, 3, we hear, um, hear it said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Well, Mark there is quoting Isaiah 43, another Old Testament book. And that was originally addressed to the, uh, the exiles in Babylon uh, to tell them, hey, guys, look, you're captive right now. You're, you're in slavery, but God is about to rescue you. He's going to break the chains of your captivity. Now, what captivity, um, let me rephrase that. What are the chains that Israel and all of humanity are in, in the New Testament? Yeah, Mia. How are they enslaved or captive? What are they held captive by? Is it talking about sin? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's talking about sin. So he's saying in the same way that God rescued um, or freed Israel from captivity in the Old Testament, he's going to rescue you again, Israel, and all humanity from sin and from the consequences of sin, which is death, right? He's going to rescue us from that by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Um, so that's the answer to C there under 13B. Any questions on that? Okay. So we're going to go to John the Baptist now um, on the next page. And it's, there's not a specific number associated with that. It's just the heading is John the Baptist, you can see there, right? Okay. Um, and John the Baptist is kind of interesting. He comes to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry and mission. Um, but John does something kind of radical, kind of unheard of, that rocks the boat, so to speak, in his day. He summons his fellow Israelites, his fellow Jews, to be baptized with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the river of the Jordan. Now, normally, for Israelites, only Gentiles would be baptized uh, when they converted to Judaism. Only Gentiles would have to be baptized. If you were a Jew, you typically didn't need to be baptized for repentance and the forgiveness of sins. So how do you think that would have made the Jews feel? Probably really puffed up or way better than anybody. Yeah, it would have made them feel way better than, than everybody else, make them feel uh, arrogant or superior, maybe. And how do you think it would, how do you think they would feel once they heard John was saying they had to be baptized? They'd probably feel pretty mad. And yeah. And maybe offended. Yeah. Offended? Yeah. Why do you think they would feel offended? Because they've been told that they're so good that they don't even need to be baptized. They can just go along their day. When someone's saying, no, you're a sinner, you have to be baptized, you know, they're going to be a little bit. It's offended. kind of like saying they're on the same standing as the Gentiles are. Exactly, yeah. All of a sudden, they got to look in the mirror and face up to the reality that they're sinners too. And they thought that everybody else was worse than them. And really, they're just as bad. They're just as sinful, and they need God's grace just as much. And John the Baptist is saying, Israel, you're not special just because of uh, who your family is or just because of 
your forefathers or your history or anything like that, you guys need God's mercy just as much as the rest of them. And sin is a universal problem. It infects people of all ages and stages of life, people of all nations and tribes and tongues. The only person that never had sin was Jesus. Um, um, so A would be Jesus. And then um, for the John the Baptist, it would, so would A be Jesus? A, um, that is, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Emma, because um, I was looking at that question before class and that's initially, it, Jesus is true, but kind of what we're getting at here is uh, that he actually was calling Jews or, and so you can write Jews and all humanity or all people. And then um, eventually Jesus, um, but um, not quite yet. And then the second part there, B, why would John the Baptist's ministry have been seen as radical? Because normally only Gentiles were baptized. Okay, I got it. All right, any other questions on that? Very good. So then getting to the next section there, Jesus baptism. Uh, we can go ahead and look first, uh, before we answer the questions on the page there, you got all these symbols on the PowerPoint slide. What do you guys think the different symbols mean? Um, Mia, what do you think the, uh, the blue drop of water stands for? Um, baptism. Yep, that's exactly right. And why is there a bird there? A dove? Do you guys know what a dove normally stands for? Yeah, Emma? Um, wasn't it, wasn't when Jesus baptized, wasn't there um, a dove that came down and like flew over them? Yep. So there was a, a dove appear, a, appeared in, on him, right? And, um, and but it actually it wasn't actually a dove, it just appeared like a dove. And who was it really? It was an angel. Not quite, we're very close, that's a good guess. It was the Holy Spirit. Oh. And so the, a dove always kind of stands for the Holy Spirit in scripture. Um, and the same is true for us today. Whenever there's a baptism, the Holy Spirit is always there. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes and lives and he makes his home in our hearts when we're baptized. And he made his home in your heart when you were baptized. Um, and then we also have a crown here. What does our crown symbol mean? What does it represent? A king. A king, very good. That's pretty straightforward. And then the last symbol we have here is somebody that is kneeling. What do you guys think that symbol represents? Um, like a lambskin or someone bowing down to the king? Someone, yeah, that's, that's a good guess. It's kind of um, maybe a little confusing just because of this diagram here, but kind of the, the way our PowerPoint curriculum uses it, um, just by itself, it always symbolizes someone who is a servant. Okay. Okay. So like you're a servant kneels. And so kind of what this PowerPoint slide helps us to remember and I'm, I'm kind of hitting this in detail because this will probably be a, the sort of slide that we would look at when our, in our final exam stuff. But this slide is, to, is to talking about Jesus' baptism, right? That Jesus came and he was a king, but then you look at this kneeling figure and what sort of king was he? A servant king. A servant king. That's exactly right. Mark 10 45 says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. 
not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, which is totally the opposite of every other king you've ever heard of, right? I mean, what king normally, normally kings are served by the people around them. They're not serving them. They're not waiting on them. They're not going to give up their life for them, but that's exactly what Jesus did. And Jesus was baptized, as we heard about this last week in the sermon, in the place of sinners, right? He stands with sinners there and he takes their place on the cross. Um, but God also kind of blesses him and says, this is who my son is. It's not who you would expect to be serving sinners and to die for them, but this is who my son is. Um, so when Jesus is baptized, uh, a voice from heaven, the, the voice of God the Father, cries out, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the first part of that statement is from um, another Old Testament passage, Psalm 2-7. But it was used in uh, coronation ceremonies when someone was kinged, right? When they became king um, and they took over the throne. And so part of what God the Father is saying here is, look, here's my king. Here's the messianic king. And yet he's standing with sinners. That's not where you would expect a king to be. You wouldn't expect him to be with the, the people who are dirty and unclean in their sin. You wouldn't expect him to be with um, the villains and the, um, you know, the no good people up to no good and those sorts of things. But that's where Jesus as a king goes to, to serve the people who are sinful and to become sin for them. Yes, Emma. So the nature would be uh, that he um, would go and like hang out with the servants and the slaves. Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah, very good. Um, was getting there. And so it's that he is a, a servant king. And Luke has a nice way of putting it, too. You can write this down as well. Luke says that Jesus is a friend of sinners. So he's a servant king, and he's a friend of sinners. Okay. So, and this is kind of, this might be kind of a tough question, but I'm going to ask it. It's not uh, specifically on your worksheet, but can you guys think of where else people actually call Jesus a king in the gospels? It's not where you would expect to give you a hint. Any guesses? About the only other place Jesus is actually recognized as a king, even though it's mockingly, is at his trial and his execution. And the soldiers mock him. Remember, they clothe him with a with purple, which is a royal color, and they they mockingly call him the king of, of the Jews. And they put a they put a crown on his head, but what's the crown made of? Thorns. Thorns, right? Um, and all of these these different things they they give him, um, they beat him, and they torture him. And this, do you guys remember when Jesus is crucified? There's a sign put above his head. Do you remember what that sign says? The King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. And the religious leaders were actually upset about that because they wanted Pilate to change it and to say he only said to be King of the Jews. He's not actually the King. And Pilate said. I'm going to, I'm not going to change it. And little did Pilate know that that was actually a, it was an accurate, it was a truthful statement. Um, he's a, but it's kind of interesting that Jesus really isn't recognized as a king elsewhere um, in the Bible or in, in the gospels rather by the people, um, except kind of in an, an ironic sense there. 
at the cross where he's serving humanity and giving himself, giving his life as a ransom for many. Uh, he's our servant king there. And so he does wear a crown, but it's a crown of thorns, which is not your typical uh, kingly appearance or conduct. Um, and there are a couple places in the Gospels where people kind of want him to be a king, but they want him to be not a servant king. They want him to be a, a king of power and a king who expands their territory and all those sorts of things. Um, but nobody really knows what sort of king he's going to be, that he's going to be a servant king here. Um, any questions or comments on that? Have you ever thought about Jesus as a servant king before? Yeah. Yep. How does thinking about him as a servant king change? And knowing that he rules over everything, he, he has absolute power, absolute authority. He created the universe. And knowing that he, he took on flesh to be your servant king, how does that make you feel about him? Um, it makes me feel the same because like, um, because like I always knew that like he uh, like was with the sinners because he healed them. And I remember this one story when he went to some like sinner's house. So it really makes me feel the same way about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it, but it kind of reminds you of those sorts of things, right? That he... Um, he likes to be with people, and he's not too high or mighty, right, to pay attention. Um, I'll just tell this quick little story, and then I'll, I'll close uh, for us here. I'm going to see if I can, whoops, uh, I'll see if I can find this picture real quickly to bring it up for you guys. But uh, there's this, sometimes in castles, in Europe, they were built way up high on these cliffs. And they, they were built so high up on these cliffs that it was pretty, uh, like this one here, you guys can see that? Whoa. That's yeah. Edinburgh Castle in Scotland, and I've been there. And when you live down in that town you might spend your whole life and never see the king or the queen. And you might wonder, do they even know I exist? Do they care about me? Do they care if I live or if I die? Maybe they want nothing to do with me. They think I'm just a commoner, I'm trash, I'm a sinner, um, all those sorts of things. And we don't have a king who stays up in a castle like that. We have a king who comes down to be with his people a king who, who leaves all of his comfort and his power, his rights and privileges and all those things, and instead he comes down to serve you. He leaves heaven behind to serve you, to give his life for you, um, and to be beaten and mocked and to, to die and to rise for you. So that's the king that we have. Um, that's Jesus. And you can see where it doesn't line up with the expectations that Israel's people had or that anybody has in the entire world. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Um, and you guys have maybe heard this before, so it seems familiar in some ways. But as you get older, you kind of start to realize this really goes against the way that the world thinks. Um, but that's actually cool in a lot of ways because... Jesus gives us hope. Uh, he gives us a different way than the world offers, a way of peace, a way of forgiveness, a way of life where there otherwise wouldn't be peace or life or hope. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today. I'd like you to keep the, your worksheets, okay? And we'll pick those up next time uh, with this lesson here. And we'll continue along learning about the gospel there. So. Keep doing your sermon notes. Keep watching, um, watch the Gospel of Mark if you can there. And then 
I'll email out the memory work stuff. So go ahead and you can start working on that. Um, your parents will get that too. Um, so if they have questions or you do, you can contact me or go back and watch the video uh, when we talked about that earlier. That will be up on YouTube by tomorrow morning. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and pray real quickly and then we'll go. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and I ask you to keep in our hearts and minds, Lord, that um, just your love for us and the willingness that you had to leave your comfort in heaven, to leave your throne and to come and to serve us, to die for our forgiveness and to rise for our new life in you. Keep us close to you, keep us all healthy and safe and bless our week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.